be, I guess, processing pipeline this thing has, or are you talking like session? I'm talking really this what state means is essentially it's state for your particular resource handler and not necessarily any other part of like the application necessarily. So is this not like cluster of maybe variables that you're using for your application? Yeah. Yeah, it's whatever you populate it, right? Like if you have a resource that um, that looks up something in a database, one of the one of the functions that you can export is called con uh, is called resource available, right? And you can actually do that database lookup uh, or look it up in a cache. And if it's available, you can say true, right? And so then it'll continue to process. If you say false there, then it'll actually throw back a response and say this resource is not available right now. Um, yeah, so, and then you can populate state at that point. So does that mean that, like, basically all of these functions, they're all built to be, like, referentially transparent? So that way you can always do your unit tests or whatever. Yes. State, so that's kind of nice. Exactly. Yeah, so the, the functions are really small. They're really discrete. They're really independent from one another. Um, in Haskell terms, you try not to have side effects, right? Like, you, you just want to do that one thing, and that's all it does. Um, and... Um, this this state variable is really sort of your scratch pad to like pass things through all the different functions that you want to execute on. Um, so if you have something, for example, if you look up something in one function and you want to pass it to another function, you'd have to do that using this. So that's kind of what its purpose is. Um, rep file here is context de context dependent. So for example, if your function like the the resource available function returns a, it expects a boolean, so this has to be a bool. Um, if you return false here, then it's not available. If you return true, then it is available. If you return something else, then it will say uh, that's not going to work. <laughs> um, yeah, it will it will crash, um, and it will Erlang crash, which is um, not as bad as in most other languages. Um, but but yes, it will not function correctly. Um, and then of course these terms are exactly what you have passed in. Um, since in Erlang uh, values are immutable, these may be mutated. So if you need to mutate your request, like you need to put a content header in or something like that, um, I'm, going to, I'm going to show an example of that in just a second. Um, if you need to mutate either the request or the response or the state variable here, that's where you would do it. It's in the return value from the function. Okay. So we're talking about... We're on the air, by the way. What, finally? Finally. All right, cool. The long last. I don't know if you want to try and rejoin real quick. Sorry. I just your slides. Um, I don't know. Do you guys want me to try to host, join this real quick or not? <laughs> All right, sure, fine. Why not? Um, did you uh, did you um, send me the the link or whatever? I posted it. Yeah. So this is the live stream, and then uh, I need the hangout URL. The live stream. Oh, okay. So th there should be two separate things. There's there's the, the YouTube URL, and then there's the Hangout URL. All right, let me email this to myself. You. Yeah, so um, in November, this is going to be like, uh, this is going to be like silk. It's going to just be <laughs> a smooth like glass. Are you at gmail.com? Um, yeah, it forwards to the other place. So. It's fine. All right, let's see if you that. I also invited you, so you should have gotten it, honestly. Here we go. See if you get the invitation. I got the invitation. Yay! I thought I invited you when I spoke when I unlocked it, but I guess it decided I didn't want to do that. Oh, I right, see. So I have to check a box. There. Check the box. Screen share. All right. Now I see your your beautiful. Okay. Yeah. Is it working? Yeah. So how do I? 
the answer to the how do I question is I don't know. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <coughs> I don't know. Um, oh, so my mic. I think this thing has its own mic. Yeah, that's what I have it set up to. Okay. All right. So I think we're good. All right. Hopefully we don't have meetup inception. <laughs> All right. So uh, I want to talk about manipulating re requests and responses. This is what, exactly what I stopped talking about just a second ago. Um, so the way that this works is that, is that Web Machine provides a helper function called WRQ, which stands for web request. Um, and there's a, there's like literally a ton of functions, not literally, but there are a lot of different functions in there that deal with manipulating the values that are in that rec value. Um, for example, one of them that's very common that you will probably use a lot if you write a web machine is get rec header, right? And then you say what header name you care about, and that's just a text string, and then the request. So this thing looks up the, the header value and then returns it, and it either returns the atom undefined and um, and Adam in this case is uh, is a is a um, it's an Erlangism, but I'm pretty sure it's in a lot of other languages too. Um, it's just a way to say that this is a tag value and it's not defined. Um, and then the header value, so whatever the actual header value is, it either returns the Adam undefined or the actual header value, um, and that's what the function returns. So um, a couple of things about Erlang: if a function always has to return a value, always, always, always has to return a value. Um, and uh, it may not return the value <laughs> you expect, but it will always return a value. Um, and usually what it returns is if, you, if you're looking up something and you can't find it, it will return this undefined. Um, so that's a, that's a really good one. Um, here's one that mutates state. Um, this is a set response header, which you might have guessed from the function name. Um, so you put in the header name that you want to set and the header value that you want to you set it to, and then the request. Uh, the request parameter, and then it actually returns to you a mutated uh, request parameter that you can pass off. Um, so, you know, earlier I had this JSON handler, remember? Um, so here's the same handler, but this time we're going to actually set content type application JSON, so that when you when you execute, uh, when you request application JSON, it doesn't just say that this is, uh, it doesn't have a content type. Um, we're going to explicitly tell you that it's application JSON. And um, lo and behold, if you do this, then you will get application JSON. Uh, when you make a call that says, "Hey, I want application JSON," it was doing that on your behalf before. Well, this it wasn't. This wasn't set or that was Yeah, it wasn't set at all. Actually, um, it just said, "Here's your response." <laughs> um, there was no semantic. Uh, there was no semantic response there at all. Okay. Um, so one of the really cool features about Web Machine is, is that you're traversing through this giant diagram of a state machine, right? Um, how, so how do you figure out where in the state machine you've gone wrong? So um, you're processing a bunch of requests, and you really want to get uh, more information about that. So what Web Machine provides to you is a visual debugger, and this is actually super slick. Um, so over here, you can see that I have um, I have part of that state machine diagram. Uh, I've zoomed in on it specifically, um, and down here there's this little diamond that says O18. I know you guys can't read that, but that's what it says. Um, and then here's the magic 200 box. So this request was successful, um, and all I had to do was mouse over this box here, and it actually says, okay, here's all the functions I've executed uh, for that particular decision tree. Um, I generated an e-tag, I looked up the content types you provide, I decided to send HTML, and then I looked at the encodings that you provide, and you just geez it, so I'm going to geez it at the response. And then over here, you can actually see um, within the call that says generate e-tag, and this is actually the input and the output over here. So you can scroll through that, it's really easy, you can um, actually navigate through this entire chart um, just by, um, if you have a MacBook or something, you can just um, move it around on your mouse pad, and it, it's really slick. Um, so this is when everything goes, yeah, Chris. Yeah, it's in a browser. Um, so the, the way you activate this is, um, it's all described on Bash's wiki about, uh, about Web Machine, but the way you activate this is that um, instead of saying OK at init time, you say I want to trace, and then you say what directory to write the traces into. And then um, within Web Machine, you can actually say for directory X, uh, use resource Y, right? And then when you navigate to uh, 127.001, uh, 
uh, 8,000 slash blah, um, you'll see a list of all the traces. You click one of them, and then it shows you this whole thing. Yes. Yes. Uh, yeah, it produces a per request. Um, and uh, so then you can see all the things that it decided to do uh, and how it wanted to handle all the requests. Um, let's see. Yeah, so in this particular case, um, I actually looked up, I actually did my request with Chrome, um, and I didn't use curl. So um, that's, that's, where all, that's where all of this stuff came from, like accept language, accept encoding, accept uh, content types, all that stuff. All right, so here's when something doesn't go right. Um, so in this case, I used curl. Um, I said I want application XML, which is not supported media type. Um, and uh, this time, web machine said, is there an acceptable media type available? It said false, so I got 406, not acceptable. Um, and then if I wanted to find out more information about that, uh, you'll notice that there's three tabs over here. One is called Q, which is the request. One is called R, that's the response. And then there's D, there's a D tab, which is for the decision. Um, and you can flip through all those different tabs and look at the request, look at the response, and look at the decisions. Um, and then in the decisions area, um, it was, this was better on the previous page. But in the decisions area, basically, um, you can say what part of the flowchart you want to look at, and then you can specifically, using a, a dropdown, um, pick what function uh, input output that you want to look at, that you want to examine. Um, if you don't want to use your browser, by the way, you can also look at these using uh, using a text file, a text file editor, uh, Sublime or, or Vim or Emacs or whatever. Um, and it's just basically a set of Erlang tuples. So it's pretty easy to parse um, if you want to. So uh, now we've gotten to the point where we're going to talk about URL dispatch. Um, Web Machine is uh, akin to most of the other sort of framework type things that you've seen. Um, the idea is that you're going to associate a specific module with, with some uh, route. Um, we'll talk about the various ways to specify that. Um, are there any questions so far? All right. I can actually see the on XML. Yeah. Yeah, the default type is text HTML. Right. If you do text plain, then you'll get 406. But if you just do curl and you don't specify anything, you'll get HTML. Um, assuming that's available, <laughs> right? If you do, if you override what Web Machine's defaults are by saying what content types you provide, um, then it'll be whatever the first thing in that list is. So, if you say I only provide you JSON, then that's what you're going to get. Um, okay. So here we have a really straightforward tuple again. Um, this is the uh, route that we want. Um, it's just A, and then Here's the Erlang that we're going to execute. And then this thing over here, um, this thing over here is actually the, the parameter list that you pass into init. So this is the point where you initialize things in init. So if you wanted to dispatch something to a specific URL and then pass in something to the init handler for that particular resource, that's where you do it, right here in that particular list. Um, so that's super basic. Um, are there any questions about that part of it? All right, we're going to get into fancy URL dispatch now. Um, and fancy is essentially things that includes atoms and wildcards. Um, this is, I guess, not too fancy. Uh, it's not mind-blowing by any stretch of the imagination. But um, the, the interesting thing here is that um, this, this atom of asterisk collects everything that follows behind what you're trying to match. So in this particular case, it would match ABC, it would match ABCD, um, but it would not match E, it would not match F, it would not match Z. Right, the all return four four is not available. Um, so, so that's pretty straightforward. I hope. Any questions about that? Okay. Um, the other thing is that you can bind elements um, to tag values, um, and the way that you do that is by specifying in the position what the what the tag value is. Um, in this particular case, we're gonna we're gonna bind whatever follows a to the uh, to the value foo, um, and then it's the same thing as before. And then you can retrieve that value foo using this function called path info, and you just pass in the tag value that you want in the request, and you, it will get back, uh, you know, string B. So um, hopefully that's pretty straightforward, right? So if you have a URL of AB, and you say, I want you to tag the second value as foo, then you're going to get back string B. I assume that works for multiple 
specified, you can tag multiples in there, or is it only for the second one? Well, in this particular case, it's just for the second one. So I actually um, want to, I have a slide to show uh, what happens if you try to do more things than that. Um, so in this particular case, um, you, you want to bind the second element to foo, but you can pass in the URL of ABCD, right? You get a 404. The reason you get a 404 is because there's nothing to match the element beyond the second one. So if you want to do that, then you have to do this. You say A, foo, and then you do asterisk, and then that will dispatch to ABC and will bind this to foo, and the rest of the stuff is also available in a different uh, WRQ function. Uh, it's called path tokens. Um, and then it will get back a list of C and D. Strings. Um, so that's also pretty straightforward. Are there any questions about that? No. Yeah. Okay. Just to bind with making a match for each one instead of wild carding it like that. What am I yes. doing? Bar bass with yeah. B, C, and D. Yeah, so if you did foo bar and bass, then it would bind to B, C, and D. Okay. Exactly. Um, yeah, so the sort of drawback is, is that um, there's not there's not a uh, I've seen in some web frameworks. Frameworks they have like a splat collector that like you know it'll bind everything that follows that position into a dictionary or something or hash or whatever. Um, as far as I know, that's not available in web machine. Um, I'm I, I'm hardly a web machine expert, but as far as I know, that's not there's no splat operator or anything like that. They just have the the binding and then the wildcard. The and you'll get a you'll get a list with C and D in it. Yeah. So um, there's a WRQ function called um, path tokens. And it will return everything that follows the tagged element as a list, um, as strings. So Erlang is a is a is a loosely typed language, um, unlike some other ones, um, especially like Haskell. <laughs> um, so Erlang is loosely typed, and um, it uh, it I guess it, I would call it gradual typing. Um, its type system is probably more akin to Perl's than anything else, um, where you don't really care about types until you care about them. <laughs> um, so, uh, are there any questions about that? Okay. So, handling post. Um, so, this I've already mentioned like the semantics around post are kind of ambiguous. Um, you know, people treat post as an update. People treat post as create. Um, internally here at AlertLogic, my team treats post as create. Um, so, for example. Um, there's uh, and, and different people have different ideas about that. And Web Machine supports post as create or post as update or both. Um, you can totally control it yourself. There are several uh, methods that it exposes to you. One of them is called allowed methods, um, and what that does is it essentially says these verbs are valid for this resource. So you can specify explicitly. You can do get and put on this resource. You can do get and post on this resource. Um, you can do only deletes on this resource, etc. Um, this one is uh, returns uh, expects a bool. Um, so this one says uh, if you do post is create, that means that when you call this with a post verb, that you're expecting for a web machine to create a new resource. Um, create path uh, is uh, is also available, um, and it it actually helps you to build the um, it helps you to build the new path for the the body that you want to return. Um, not explaining this very well. Uh, it helps you to create uh, the body that you want to return um, to the requester. And um, it, as long as you get your path activated, um, it will go ahead and execute that function. Um, you guys have already seen content types accepted. Um, you, can, you can go ahead, since that's a freeform function, you can put whatever kind of processing handling that you want in there. Um, and that's why I have handler functions at the bottom. So, for example, if you say, um, I want to accept JSON for this particular handler, um, and uh, I want you to uh, treat posts as create, then you can say, okay, when I get JSON bodies um, in my request, I'm going to go ahead and process that JSON, stick it in a database, and return a 201, or whatever, whatever uh, you need to return. <clears throat> Are there any questions about that? If you want to do updates, by the way, then you just say post is created is false, or you leave it out because the implied value is false, um, and then you have all these other things available to let you handle that particular request however you need to handle it. Um, some other cool stuff that I don't want to talk about tonight, but um, you guys should know it exists. Uh, Web Machine handles streaming requests and responses, um, and it also handles file uploads. And um, 
those are available pretty straightforwardly. Um, so here's some res um, resources. Um, Fasho uh, does everything pretty much open source. Uh, web machines available on GitHub. Um, my uh, my WM Hello thing is there as well. Uh, this slide deck is available on Speaker Deck um, at my URL. And um, that's that's pretty much what I have. Uh, are there any other questions um, about Web Machine or anything else? Yeah. Yeah. So um, yeah. So if you um, just to just to sort of drive home the point. Um, when you have a function and you get the request, this request value may be mutated. So yes, you can mutate the value here, and you can mutate the state by passing out a new state there. This one or the next one? This one? Finding elements? Yes, yes. OK. Um, it's it's a it's a web machinism. It's it's completely internal to the application. Um, in the priv directory uh, of the application, there's this file called dispatch.conf. Um, dispatch.conf is basically a list of tuples, um, and you chain tuples together, and that allows you to specify multiple resources across your whole application. That's not. No. Hey, it, Mark. Uh, Glenn is asking if you can repeat the questions for you. Before you answer them, yeah, that's yeah, that's a, that's a good point. Uh, I'll try to do that. Yeah, good, good. Thanks. Keep me on my toes. So, was there a question about? Where? I was just thinking like that makes sense. That's a good thing. So I was thinking, yeah, that's a good thing. How like I didn't understand why we even had one, but now now that makes sense. Yeah. So right. So this is basically a lookup value. Um, yeah. Um, and, and I know this looks it does it looks exactly like an MFA uh, module function argument tuple, um, but it's actually uh, internal to the application. Um, so the question was about uh, why is foo an atom and not a, a Erlang variable, and the reason is because this is basically just a tag uh, that you'll look up later using path info. Are there any other questions about web machine or? Um, it's really, really good at writing API endpoints. Um, I would say that's probably its strongest use case. Um, that's the thing that I've seen it be used for most frequently. Um, it is totally capable of serving whatever kind of content you want. Um, one of the other things that's in priv directory uh, that I haven't shown you guys is uh, there's a whole there's a whole sort of set of places for you to put static files. These could be CSS or they could be um, they could be uh, JavaScript libraries or whatever else that you want to put up on the whole visual side of things, if that's the way you want to go. Um, but it's really, really good at writing RESTful APIs, um, especially with sort of good semantics or whatever. Um, so the question was, uh, what is a good use case for web machine? Sorry, I'm not used to repeating the question, but I'll try to I'll try to get better. Um, there you go. What's that? What's the hands-on use case? So is there a particularly you know, strategy like, oh, I can't believe that was. Um, I guess, I guess, uh, you know, I, I mean, I think it's really good at pretty much everything. Um, but I guess if I were, if I was going to write something uh, quick and dirty, not that I would ever do anything like that. But um, if I were just to write something and hammer it out, I probably would not reach for a web machine. Um, I always think of web machine as kind of being an industrial strength tool. Um, and so if I'm just writing a, <laughs> a hack or a feat for my own personal use, then, um, then I might not reach for it. But uh, but yeah, if I were if I were to write uh, an industrial strength API that I wanted to expose internet scale, um, yeah, that would be very high on my list of things to look at and use. Absolutely. Um, but you know, on the other <coughs> side of that, um, it is a great way to get get more used to and writing Erlang uh, more frequently. Um, it's pretty pretty uh, pretty understandable. It's approachable. Um, there's there's not too much uh, with the visual debugger. Uh, it's such a such a cool tool. Do um, you guys want to see the visual debugger like in action? Um, so I can I can kind of show that. Um, hopefully. Um, oh, the video call ended because of an error. Oh no! Oh good. 
my Google Talk plugin crashed. Thanks, Google. <laughs> I don't know if Chrome's going to crash or not, but. <laughs> All right. Um, so let's see. That was actually how I got it working. I had to, I had to quit out of, like, I tried Safari and Firefox, and it totally failed. So I finally gave up and walked out of my account from use that and work. All right, so um, so here's a uh, here's my uh, this is my um, this is my Erlang VM that's running over here. Um, gosh, it's really hard to read. Let's do this. That's better. Yes, much better. Um, so there's that. So I have a web machine running over here, and um, I actually have the uh, I have the What's going on? Um, yeah, I don't know. I'm off the hangout, by the way. I guess. Oh, it's coming back. What? Wow, it looks crazy. Like. It's like rainbows and shit. <laughs> nice. Look at it. Oh, cool. Nice. Uh, <laughs> Come on, snap out of it. <laughs> so this is the wiki page about the, the visual debugger. Um, and the reason I came here is because I wanted to copy this uh, this uh, Erlang directive real quick. So there's no hope of getting back in the um, in the hangout. Uh, I'll I'll give it a shot. Okay. That or uh, Glenn suggests inverting your screen so that it can be seen. <laughs> wow, it really is media inception right there. That's kind of cool. It's blowing my mind. All right. Um, so, so over here, over here, I have. Um, Can you share your screen? Yes. <sighs> <laughs> yes, good. I see a blank. Yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. All right. So over here, I have I have web machine running. I have web machine running in Erlang VM. Um, the the URL fragment I'm going to use to dispatch off of is called W and Trace, and it's writing into my temp folder. <coughs> and then over here, I have Chrome running, and I have um, I have my um, I have my hello world thing here. I'm just gonna call that again, and then I'm gonna go to, and then you can see all the requests that I've made right here, and then I'm gonna pick that one, which is the most recent one, and you guys can see. I don't. Is this is pretty hard to see, right? <laughs> well, all right. So I'll zoom in a little bit, but basically. There's a purple line that goes through this whole state machine, and I'll just kind of outline it here. But this is the way it goes. It goes up through this whole thing. It goes over here. 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 It goes down here, and then it hits here, which is 200 OK. <laughs> right? Um, so now we can zoom in really close. All right. That's a lot easier to read, right? OK. So now you can see all the purple stuff. Um, again, so there's this a decision tree right here, B13, WM hello resource ping. And I didn't implement this. This just came out of the box. But you can see that it returned Pong, right? That's what it returned, Pong. It says, hey, I'm alive. Okay, so let's move up over here. 
We have accept exists. Again, types provided. We want HTML. That's what we get. Is an acceptable type available? Yes. We're going to traverse through all this stuff. Acceptable coding exists? Yes. Resource exists? Yes. Right? If match exists, false. If unmodified exists, false. If none matched exists, false. If none matched star exists, false. E tag in if none matched, also, uh, sorry, true. And then is this a get or a head? That's what this says right here. It says true. And you can see that it returned not modified because Chrome caches things. So since I have E tags turned on, it says don't bother to fetch this body, you already have it. Just show the cache. It's kind of cool. Um, and then, so if you do another one here, um, it's the same thing. It says 304, here's the query, get, response, decision. And then you can just go through this whole flowchart right here through the drop down. This is, this is a malformed request. And, oops. Woo! Um, so you can see that it says malformed request was not exported. So that means I'm not checking to see if the request was valid or not. Um, if I did have a function called malformed request, it would throw it into there and it expects a bool. So if I say true, then it's a good request. If I say false, then it returns 400 bad requests. Um, so yeah, so that's why machine. So exported means that you provided an implementation for it? Yeah, basically. Um, and it's actually a specific Erlang directive. Um, if I can just go back to that real quick, like, um, let's see here. Yeah. It's like you're declaring that there's an implementation that's in the, in the code somewhere. When you, when you, up top, when you say export, right? You're basically saying, I, I did this. Is that right? What happened? Hello? That's me, actually. It looks like you. Uh... I'm sure it works perfectly on Hangout. Actually, it looks like you got stuck. Oh, no, no, cut it. Yeah. <laughs> 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 all right, well, I was trying to be all fancy and stuff, but um, yeah, this is not, it's not working. Um, well, all right. We'll uh, let's see. Um, that text is small. Yeah, I know. I'll fix that in a minute. All right. The Hangout's kind of uh, behind right now. All right. Well, they're caught up just now. So, well, that's really hard to read. Sorry about that. Uh, yeah, I can read it here. Let's do this. All right, that's pretty big. So, just uh, just as Erlangisms, the first thing we have to do is tell Erlang that this is a module, and this is the name of the module, um, and then we're going to export functions, and these are just atoms that have arities following them. <coughs> so, for example, I have init one, two HTML two, two JSON two generate e tag to, encodings provided to, contents provided to, and then I have implementations of all those down here. So these directives tell the compiler that you should make these functions available to external things that want to call them. You can always call other functions inside your own module, but if you want other people to be able to use them, other modules, then you have to export them. So Erlang has a really basic sort of access control API layer or whatever. Um, but that's what that means. So it, when it's saying that it's not exported, it means literally that it's not in this list. Yeah. And the include by is like a header or something. So yeah. So this is a th yeah. So this is a, a header file. It's a hurl. Um, it's Erlang header. <laughs> yeah. I call them hurls. <laughs> it's HRL is the is the ending. Um, so yeah, that's what that is. Uh, 
any support for uh, other than as a debugger turning on tracing and you know, looking what's going on with the system? Is there any uh, support for interacting with it at runtime? Yeah. So I've got yeah, how to web machine. Well, I mean, it's the standard Erlang thing, right? So um, you can you can see that uh, even though I'm running the application here, I have I have an Erlang shell. Um, that's what all. That's what the one and the twos are. Uh, these are all interactive REPL things. I can run whatever Erlang functions I want inside of here. Um, turn on things. Add dispatch. Turn off dispatch. Turn on tracing. Turn off tracing. Turn on logging. Turn off logging. Remote shell. All the all the normal Erlang management stuff you can do. Um, yeah. And that's within like the running server. Yeah, well, so normally you start your service headless. So you say at Erlang, don't start a shell. But if you want one, you can start one. And if you start it on your local machine, you can connect to the remote machine as long as you know the cookie value, which is this super basic access control layer. Um, a cookie is essentially a shared password with the remote node. If you know the cookie of the remote node, you can connect your local node to that one and execute your own local command on that node. That comes out of the box. That's just an Erlang thing you get for free. Yeah, you don't have to program anything special. You just get it. It's gratuitous. <laughs> yeah, it's totally gratuitous. Thank you for using Erlang. Here's some easy remote user uh, user calls. Um, yeah. So, any other questions or anything? You mentioned like that sometimes there are some things that would cause problems in compile time. This is more of like an Erlang question. Yeah. Um, so, but you, you mentioned it's not statically typed. So it's not. You, so I mean, type errors are caught at runtime. Pretty right? much. So I mean, so I mean, what kind of things are? I mean, is it is it a compiled language? Or yes. It, okay. Yeah, it is a compiled language. The language compiles to a a, a virtual machine. So um, it compiles to an intermediate format. Uh, so it compiles to an abstract syntax tree, which is specific to Erlang. Um, and then it compiles into a, a Beam file, which is an actual interpreted virtual machine. Um, and that sits on top of an infrastructure that's written in C++ and all that sort of stuff. That's how it goes from interpreted uh, AST into bytes, basically, that get executed in whatever sequence they need to get and are, and are there certain things that you can catch at compile time? Well, um, so Erlang has... Syntax, the question is, um, how, can you, how, how can you catch type errors? Um, I'm summarizing, but... But that sounds like the question. Um, so Erlang comes with a tool called Dialyzer. And Dialyzer actually is a type an uh, analyzer. Um, one of the things I didn't show you because it wasn't super relevant to the topic at hand was you can, when you write a function for Erlang, you can include a specification for it. And that tells er the Erlang compiler and Dialyzer specifically what types to expect for that function. And Dialyzer actually will run checks across all of your code base to make sure that if you do have type errors, type mismatch errors, it will alert you of them and say, hey, you're calling this function A, and it expects to get a binary string, but you're actually passing an integer. So that's not going to work. Yeah, we'll go ahead and try. It will not catch every type error. Yeah, it dialyzer's not foolproof. It tells you that it has a problem, but it will not catch it. Right. Yeah, it'll just say, oh, you're right. Dialyzer is not infallible, but um, it is it is a pretty good tool. Um, yeah, and, and and even if uh, even if the, even if you do have a type mismatch, um, uh, Erlang kind of honey, honey badgers. It doesn't really care very much. Um, it'll uh, it'll go ahead and try to do it anyway, and then blow up spectacularly. So, yeah. um, how, how how often do you have type coercion issues that are unintended? You know, like do you, I mean, if you have any kind of testing at all, then uh, yeah. I'm not again, not foolproof, right? Like, I would say that a lot of testing in Erlang actually ends up being around type checking, um, which is unfortunate, but you know, just kind of the parameters of the language. So, yeah, it would be nice if it had a little bit more, uh, a little bit more type specification to it than it does. But um, at this point, I don't. I'm not holding my breath expecting to see that anytime soon. Um, yeah, if you want a more strongly typed functional language, then you know. Um, I want to probably look at Scala or look at Clojure or Haskell. Um, Haskell takes types to the next level. Um, actually, F# -sharp has a really good type system, too, because um, it comes out of that ML family. So um, it's not as comprehensive as Haskell, but it's, it's pretty, pretty solid. It's pretty slick. 
Wasn't there someone here who said they started using R sharp? Yeah, it's, I, I think it's really neat. It's a neat language. Um, it's, uh, I think it's very underrated. Uh, and if I have to do Windows development again, that's, that's how I'm going to do it. So, uh, are there any other questions? Well, thanks very much. I, I appreciate uh, your time and attention. And uh, thanks for coming. And um, more pizza if you want it. And, uh, yeah. So that's all I have. But thank you. Um, just one more administrative thing. Um, you know, uh, this is a brand new meetup, and uh, so if you felt like uh, we do have a Twitter feed, uh, if you want to be follow that uh, or retweet things from it, uh, that would be awesome. Uh, you know, if you have colleagues at work, uh, let them know that we're doing this and uh, like keep doing it. And uh, you know, I, it'd be great if we could build a, a nice community of functional programmers here. Um, yeah. So, um, and again, I really would like to uh, to have all sorts of different functional languages come in and talk to us. Um, so if you have talks that you want to do or you know someone that wants to do a talk about a particular function language or a distributed computing problem or something, that would be awesome. Just put them in touch with me and work something out, figure out what time works and try to make that happen. So, um, uh, if anyone needs help getting out of the building or where the restroom is or whatever, I can totally help with that too. So, uh, but that's, that's all I have for tonight. So, thanks for coming. Thank you.